Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, actually. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, cyber peace, international cooperation for the stability and security of the cyber domain. I'm Andrea Calderaro. I'm senior lecturer in international relations at Cardiff University, also a Robert Schumann Center fellow here at the European University Institute and coordinator of the uh, cyber diplomacy and digital transformation cluster at the Global Peace Tech Hub here at the School of Transnational Governance. Today uh, also happens that I have the pleasure to share this session and um, which is part, uh, for those of you that connect from, uh, from remote, it's part of the two days uh, conversation we are having in the context of the Global Peace Tech Hub uh, conference uh, uh, that is giving us the wonderful opportunity to reflect on technology and peace from a variety of uh, perspectives. And um, the contribution of this session is uh, somehow to, well, so far we, we, we discussed uh, technology as tools to support the peace, uh, to trigger conflict and wars. And uh, uh, today we're going to, uh, with this session that focuses mostly on cybersecurity, we're gonna look at how technology is uh, um, creating entirely new space for conflict and, and wars. And with it actually this is something that we want to discuss and reflect, take the, 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 the time to reflect on this, whether this makes sense at all. And, um, and because of that, because we are increasingly exposed to forms of cyber warfare, or others call it as hybrid warfare, uh, we, we know that there are increasing uh, need for international cooperation in the cyber domain, where diplomats, actors, industry, uh, civil society, um, increasingly negotiate uh, norms, international legal tools, uh, uh, trying to make, uh, to, to ensure safe and stability of the cyber domain. And it's something that uh, is, we re usually refer as cyber diplomacy. So today uh, we going to have the opportunity to reflect on this with, uh, with Madeline Carr with, from a University College of London. Uh, with Francesca Bosco from Cyber Peace Institute, uh, with Martin Koyabe from the uh, Cyber uh, with Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, and Vladimir Radunovic from uh, a Diplo Foundation. We're going to try to reflect on whether it makes sense at all to talk about peace and war in the cyber domain, uh, whether uh, what international co cooperation really means in the context of cybersecurity, and uh, whether the venues, the tools that we uh, we rely on so far, uh, reflect uh, somehow the complexity of this increasing need to uh, <clears throat> approach cybersecurity from a transnational governance perspective and inclusive of actors, inclusive of, of all uh, regions of the world in an equal fashion. So that is the goal of this session. A good start. Uh, it's of course, it's very conversational session, so uh, very informal, so please interact, uh, ask, provide inputs, complaints, whatever you have in mind, please do that uh, from online uh, and from the people that are here in the room. And um, I would start with, uh, with the first questions to Madeline. And um, so Madeline, as I mentioned, is professor of global politics and cybersecurity at the University College of London, but she's also senior associate at the Royal United Service Institute, RUSI in the UK, is a member of uh, the World Economic Forum of Global Council on the Connected World, Deputy Director of Refrains, and I have to stop here, otherwise I'll take it the whole time, it's, she has a, it's her fault that there's such a huge CV. And <laughs> Madeline, so first of all, the, the, the um, yeah, I would like you somehow to reflect on whether what I said, it makes sense at all. Uh, what's your take on this? And uh, uh, yes, what international cooperation, you have extensive uh, expertise as, a, as an academic, but also as a person that has been involved in a variety of uh, um, negotiations. And uh, whether, yeah, what do you think about international cooperation in the separate domain? It's all about whether it makes sense and, and so on. Thank you very much, Andrea, and um, and thanks also for for putting this panel together and inviting us and and um, for a really interesting uh, couple of days. Um, I thought I could start with some positives, maybe some some notes of optimism in terms of international cooperation on on cybersecurity, um, some developments that that I think uh, show some promise. So. There is, as, as Andrea mentioned, this uh, process underway at, 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 at the UN, um, uh, UNGGE, UN Group of Governmental Experts that, that looks specifically at, at 
um, whether we can agree some rules of the road or some norms of responsible state behavior in this context. And this really comes about as a, as a consequence of the challenges that we face of applying international law or the international laws of armed conflict in, in cyberspace. So, um, you know, there's a, a real need for some, you know, so, some kind of agreement or some, um, uh, some ability to see eye to eye on these issues because we, th those normal instruments that we have, have been able to fall back on in the past are not, not holding up in this context. Um, and I would say that that process is very slow, very, very uncertain, doesn't, doesn't always uh, yield tremendous results. But this, the, the positive sign that I see from that process is that more and more states want to be involved in that process now. That, that you know, initially when it began uh, 10 or 13 years ago, whenever it was, that, that it was a very small group of states that had any interest in that at all. And, and now we see like quite a level of competition to be part of a, a UNGGE and to help shape those conversations. So I think that's, that's positive that there's, you know, there, there, there's more and more interest in that. We're seeing also these appointment of cyber diplomats, as you mentioned, and these these new posts where they're you know they're not uniform, but they're very often a, a person with a, a, a good diplomatic background, but also connections into the private sector and into industry. So able to kind of navigate these challenges of the, that countries face in terms of of the tech sector, and and I think those are really helpful. We've also got now as the, the, the cyber crime treaty negotiations are underway. So, you know, looking at, at, at what we can, can agree uh, in terms of, of cyber crime, again, at the UN level. And we also have a very effective trusted network of practitioners, of, of people that work through these um, uh, uh, computer emergency response teams or, or, or incident response teams. Um, who have a, actually a very strong, very effective and very trusted network globally that when something does happen, they, they do work together very effectively. They're part of a separate network, though. They're not institutionalized. And this is one of the real challenges that we, we face that I, I, I'll touch on if we get time. Um, so those are all sort of some positive ways that we see cooperation happening. I think the, the, the negatives though, and the real challenges of international cooperation on cybersecurity is that it's so inextricably linked to the digital economy upon which we all, you know, very addicted now. So, so essentially we could say that over 50 years or, or so of trying, we find ourselves now less secure in terms of, of cyberspace than ever. 50 years and we are worse off than, than, than we ever were. And, and essentially this is, this is in part down to a, just a, a, a classic market failure, that there isn't, a, 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 there isn't an adequate market driver for cybersecurity, or rather that we have two symbiotic markets. We have a market, a, a tech sector that is just constantly putting insecure products out into the market and and very quickly in in, in you know in an effort to to capitalize on um uh on uh market dominance and then we have another sector that comes along behind them and and patches these insecure products you know second tuesday of every month type of thing and these two markets both incredibly lucrative are absolutely reliant on, on, on no change. The market that puts out insecure products is completely reliant on the market that, that then comes along and mops up after them. And the one that mops up after them needs those insecure markets to survive. So we have in, 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 a, in, in a way a market failure and in a way a very, very successful and lucrative market that just results in a lot of cyber insecurity. And I think that's something that that states really struggle to get away from because of the, the 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 sheer size of that economy. I think we've also seen the real failure of some. Well, the 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 U.S. in particular. 
to maximize on its advantage, the advantage that it generated over the last couple of decades of the digital revolution, where unbelievably, I mean, eye-watering amounts of money were, were made by American companies, but were not reinvested back in fundamental technologies like 5G that are now necessary to the implementation of emergent systems like the Internet of Things. And so we found you know, this extraordinary situation where the US had no 5G player at that critical moment where it needed it. Hence, the UK, the US, Australia, these countries are, are having to, to slow down their innovation in order to wait for, for, for a 5G player, an acceptable 5G player to, to catch up. So to, to misunderstand the global marketplace and the, and the, the geopolitics of, of technology so fundamentally was, was really quite shocking. And of course, that happens in the context of this broader power shift that we're living through of the you know, kind of slow decline of America and, and the rise of China, particularly in the context of emerging technologies. I, and, and, and we're seeing, which I think is the most destabilizing feature, as America becomes more aware of this power shift, it's less and less, it's behaving less and less like a global leader and more becoming you know, ever so slightly more desperate in its actions. So we see these kind of, um, uh, th this kind of intense competition in the global supply chain, which, which is, generating these kind of, um, well, a blend of security concerns and uh, effectively trade barriers, which perhaps could, could be stabilizing, but perhaps could be very destabilizing. And, and I, I just don't know enough about international political economy to be able to judge what will be the outcome of that. But I think in, in, in effect, we're left in this position of you know, a, a, what, a power transition deeply linked to the global economy um, and, and, and inextricably linked to, to, to security of, of all kinds. Um, I think I'll leave it there, Andrea. Super. Okay. Thanks so much, Martin. Of course, I have already. No, no, of course, I'm, I was saying that I have a long list of questions, but I'm not going to ask questions right away because it's, I have another question for Francesca. So Francesca is a senior strategic development and partnerships at Cyberpeace Institute, where she's leading the development of knowledge and initiatives on disruptive technologies and how to increase resilience through capacity building. Today, the contribution benefits from uh, uh, her extensive uh, work uh, in the domain of international law and human rights uh, through the United Nations, in the past, uh, through the United Nations World Economic Forum, lots of expertise on the ground. You've been living also in a variety of contexts. Uh, so, and with Cyber Peace Institute, you, um, one of the goals, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the idea is to engage, to develop a multi-stakeholder approach in the cybersecurity domain, because one of the issues in international cooperation is that it needs to be inclusive of countries, as have been already mentioned and discussed by Mandarin, but also by actors, all actors like industry and civil society supposed to increasingly contribute to the uh, to safety and security of the cyber domain and uh, yes so what's your take on this uh, need is it a is a real need uh, is going to be ever achieved a multi stakeholder approach on cyber security or is just an empty concept that we can read of it from Thanks for the challenging question. Uh, thanks for putting it uh, so so bluntly out there. So thank you so much for the for the invite. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, um, actually, uh, it's I think it's very good to come uh, right after Madeline because uh, she made a, a perfect introduction of like setting the context and also naming a couple of um, a very relevant UN processes uh, where I would like to complete adding. So out of the UNGG and also the ongoing cybercrime negotiation, I would. Uh, also add 
the um, uh, open-ended working group, uh, which is uh, indeed, I mean, the one that uh, um, with the, the UN General Assembly uh, resolution specifically is mentioning that states may decide to interact as appropriate with other interested parties, including businesses, non-governmental organizations and academia. So very much spot on on, on what you were mentioning about the multi-stakeholder approach. Just on paper, which is uh, actually the question that you asked me, well, I would say the answer to me is that the, the let's say, the, the way is uh, multi-stakeholderism, but that is, uh, there is a big but, which is meaningful and impactful. And this is why I would like maybe to, to share a little bit of, uh, let's say, the uh, Cyber Peace Institute approach, but also what we learn, let's say, throughout the way. Um, I mean, we, we publish, um, different type of uh, statement, uh, uh, including uh, we also publicly reacted to the veto received uh, in, uh, in July uh, this year uh, during the accreditation uh, uh, process uh, related to the actually our um, uh, engagement in the space. Um, I think uh, Madeline mentioned a very important thing, which is uh, an increased interest. Uh, um, and, and I see this a pose on a positive note uh, from different uh, type of like, let's say countries that were not used in a way to be a voice in cyberspace. So definitely coming more at the table. I think on the multi-stakeholder aspect, while a number of governments have reiterated their commitment towards an inclusive, for example, open-ended working group process um, in which the multi-stakeholder community has a voice, there is definitely uh, more to be done. Um, and um, there is a willingness, let's say. So I see it on a positive note, but I think it's also, um, as mentioned, very important that the multi-stakeholder community, so basically, uh, for example, us today are coming together and, uh, and try to understand where we can provide um, uh, concrete added value. I just have like four, um, uh, let's say, areas where I think the multi-stakeholder community can make a difference. The first, provide expertise. And this is, uh, um, so, uh, the, the idea is really that the multi-stakeholder community, specifically, for example, civil society organization, can um, provide the actual information regarding uh, um, existing and potential threats, for example, um, in the sphere for, of information security, specifically, for example, data security, and also the potential cooperative measures to prevent and counter such threats. Not in abstract, but what's happening on the ground and that's also the added value i think of civil society organization partnering with for example local actors both from the business and the um and the uh, academic uh, um, uh, ecosystem um i just mentioned a couple of like practical example um we we started working actually the institute was launched at the end of 2019 and we started working exactly during the pandemic practical example is that uh, how we can base our advocacy in a way that is like evidence data driven so uh, how we can back basically the advocacy that we do at the at, at the un level with actual data on what is happening and not only in terms of like numbers of attacks but also try to understand which are the laws and norms that are violated going back to uh, madeline point but also how we can really embed the human-centric dimension. This is also another important aspect where the multi-stakeholder community can play a fundamental role. So really raise the voice in terms of like what is happening when, for example, cyber attacks are um, impacting civilian infrastructure and what is happening to people, which is the real impact and the real harm that they are causing uh, that is usually not captured, let's say, in most of the reports that we are used to see um, that are produced either by cybersecurity companies or, I mean, uh, generally speaking, at the, at the state level. So provide uh, concrete expertise. We, we develop the, um, uh, the cyber incident tracer mapping the attacks against the healthcare system, or for example, now uh, within the uh, um, unfortunate uh, Ukraine conflict, uh, uh, try to understand how cyber attacks are impacting civilian infrastructure in the context of the of the Ukraine conflict and what it means, which are the type of attacks and what it means for the populations that are affected by that. So understanding, so elevate basically the knowledge on how threats impact uh, human rights and human security. And uh, also 
um, try to understand how we can best support the different communities. Like, for example, we do a lot of work with other civil society organizations via our Therapist Builders program. One part is provide knowledge and assistance. The other part is uh, why engaging in UN processes? Well, because I truly believe that the multi-stakeholder community can support in co-design norms. So not just in consultation processes, but also in co-designing processes and also drive the application of, uh, for example, the confidence building measures. And um, uh, uh, for example, in terms of like uh, co-designing norms, uh, I go back to, um, for example, the submission that we did in July, where thanks to the observation of uh, what's happening in terms of cyber attacks against the humanitarian sector specifically, we said that are there norms that are, for example, protecting NGOs in cyberspace? No, there are no norms protecting NGOs. NGOs in cyberspace, then this is something that we need to talk about. And for example, we submitted specifically back the, with the analysis at that moment in July, we collected 157 cases um, exemplifying how development and humanitarian NGOs are attacked by cyber attacks in terms of like, this is a, a sort of like law and policy development that we would like to see happening at the international level and clearly at the national level discussion. And then the last two points, uh, um, well, provide knowledge also on how, for example, international law applies to the use of information and, uh, and communication technologies by states. Um, so for example, um, uh, sort of like uh, creating this understanding of how the multi-stakeholder community can support um, the analysis of governance and accountability because uh, I mean uh, the, um, uh, the 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 states are taking commitments uh, towards uh, their their citizens, uh, but uh, how well they are performing, let, let's say, against those commitments is something where I we truly believe that uh, the civil society organization and also, for example, the academic and, and, and business institution should be involved, and also again trying to add the lens of like the human rights expertise and, and thinking about um, it's not a simply a matter of like violating norms, but what it means actually for the effect that this has on people. And so what is a human centric approach to the application of international law? And then the fourth point, I know that uh, I will leave then the floor to, to my colleagues afterwards, but the, we, we truly believe that the multi-stakeholder community should play a key role in the building capacity. First and foremost, because they are at the front line, right? So they are the people that understand where are the, um, uh, the basically the capacity building needs. And uh, so how to best integrate this feed basically. And also in our experience, uh, it's, it's not so much about like general principle about cyber capacity building, but it's really like understanding the needs of, for example, of underserved population. What it means of building capacity when you have digital divide. What it means of building capacity when you have like, uh, for example, gender exclusion or minorities exclusion. So. Um, these are all uh, kind of like knowledge gap that, that can be filled with a multi-stakeholder approach. Wonderful. Basically, you, you facilitate my question so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks so much. Yeah, fantastic. Martin. Sure. <laughs> so Martin is going to answer a few of the questions that have been already coming uh, from 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 uh, uh, Francesca. So Martin is the senior manager, of African Union Global Forum of Cyber Expertise project, a project at the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise. But before this role, uh, Martin uh, was a head of technical support and consultancy uh, at the division at the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization. Was a senior researcher and technical lead with the British Telecommunication. It's an extensive research by building, supporting the drafting national cybersecurity strategies in most of the countries in Africa, Caribbean, uh, not Asia. In Asia as well? Or? Sure. But the question is, <laughs> is uh, Martin, um, it's true. So there is uh, uh, lots of uh, actors that apparently are still excluded from, uh, from this uh, growing need for international cooperation in the cyber domain. Let me mention um, gender exclusion, but the, the other kind of skills that are really needed, but also uh, regional exclusions. So capacity building has been identified as a tool uh, that could empower people in, uh, in providing an active contributions to the field, to the negotiations. 
and uh, you are on the on the front on the, on on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this uh, particular session. And also, secondly, this is the most well balanced uh, panel. We've got two women, two men, which is very good. So um, let me. First of all, draw you into the experience that uh, we've had, especially in building capacity, in uh, south to south building capacity. But uh, the, second, the second issue is also to share with you what the African Union, but also the GFC are doing in terms of just highlighting what uh, Francesca and uh, Madeline have talked about. So the first issue is there's no doubt that cyber attacks by national states is always an issue. So therefore, if you look at the UN uh, working group uh, in terms of the new mandate for 2021, 2025, uh, we'll be looking specifically on how we can bring some specific cyber norms and cyber capacity in terms of diplomacy to make sure that we can address those issues. Uh, but many countries, as you rightly said, are also facing challenges in terms of how do they get into this discussion. And one of the issues that we see uh, coming up is the number of priorities that many countries are putting their focus. Uh, there are a number of uh, areas. So, for example, you've got, uh, first of all, many countries need what we call the national cybersecurity strategy that is robust but more importantly, that looks into the future in terms of how countries are going to maintain their cybersecurity uh, posture. Uh, most of the countries that we have, especially in Africa and other uh, continents, do still have, uh, or rather they don't have necessarily the necessary strategies that are put in place. Most of them have probably a policy they have maybe the laws, they have maybe piece and piece parcels of what is required, uh, but essentially they still need to have robust strategies. The other issue is also to look at the area of uh, assessing where these countries are. So many of the countries, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, most of the countries that we've dealt with still have what we call, uh, they have not made sure that they've assessed themselves on where they are in terms of their cybersecurity maturity, uh, what, what sort of laws and what sort of areas they need to concentrate on. So one area that we really focus on is the national cybersecurity strategy development. The second is the issue around the protection of the critical infrastructure. Many countries still are in the infancy stage of identifying what is critical infrastructure. We see this, especially in the development of certs, which Madeline touched on, uh, SATs have developed, so that is the computer emergency response teams. Uh, most of them actually have developed because of the natural uh, attachment to the ITU. Therefore, many of the countries have their SATs, uh, which is a very good uh, thing that we've noted. Uh, but most of the SATs still need enhancing, they still need capacity building and so forth so that they can be able to protect their infrastructure. The third area is the issue of capacity building. And this is awareness, and areas where we are talking about outreach, we're talking about schools, curriculum, the infancy, what we just talked about in order to bring the capacity from the grassroots. That still needs a lot of work because many of the countries have got different priorities. As you can imagine with COVID, most countries are concentrating on health, building their infrastructure, and others are trying to get into the point where they can actually build capacity of understanding. So therefore, capacity building is an all round urgent need, especially when it comes to cyber diplomacy, especially when you look at the new era of how you, dip, you develop dip, dip, uh, diplomats who understand cyber. And there's some effort that I'll talk about where this is covered. And then finally, uh, the two other issues that we've seen is the area where we talk about standards. Now, standards is critical. Most of the countries, if you look at 75 to 80% of their GDP, it depends on the small to medium enterprises. And that sector requires standards that can be able to support the value chain that actually builds the economy of these countries. So standards is an issue which needs to be looked at so that we can be able to develop that area. Cooperation, both at national, regional, 
and international level still remains a challenge. And as Martin said, we need to have more cooperation. There's a lot of cooperation going on at the moment. We have many of countries that are cooperating both at the national level, regional level, and also international level. The problem has always been the silos at the national level. So many institutions do work in silos, and that also creates what we call a stagnation in terms of development. And then finally is the issue around funding. Funding is critical because if without funds, some of these countries cannot actually make up and cover what we call the gaps that have just been identified. So therefore there's a need uh, for funding going forward in terms of helping these countries to be able to manage and close that particular gap. Uh, there are some specific uh, areas where we've intervened so I'll just mention uh, three areas which I think we could intervene going forward. So the first is the area around building and making sure that we assess where countries are, especially when it comes to peace and technology. And let's look at where are countries at the moment? What is the understanding of many of the countries? And this has to be resonated at the policy level. It has to be resonated at the legislative level, it has to resonate at the regulatory level so that we can be able to understand where countries are. That is important. And then the other second issue which we can intervene is building what we call a sustainment strategy. That means making sure that we inform, we educate, and also bring local experts onto the table. Because without the take up from local experts, especially in the countries that we're targeting, whether it's in the South specifically, you need to bring those experts on to the table so that they can be able to understand, comprehend, and be able to execute what we are talking about. So without these countries being at the table, then we have a problem. And how do we do that? You could actually do one thing. One, one of the things that we've done at the AU GFC level is to bring communities of experts and this community of experts has been developed at the moment. We have roughly about three per every country. We've chosen somebody from the ministry who understand national and strategy development, uh, what is policy. And we've also had somebody from the critical sector. That means somebody from the SAT who understands critical protection, but also involves the civil society and the private sector. So these experts, uh, have been drawn from these particular countries and we have them. So th that's one of the areas that we think we can impact knowledge of the issues of global peace tech so that it can be able to pro progress forward. And then finally is the issue of sharing knowledge. Uh, the GFCE is well known in terms of collating information. We have a huge repository of knowledge that has been gathered by different experts that experiences that have been gathered from different countries, assessments that have been done by different organizations on areas of cybersecurity. And I think building the knowledge and harnessing that knowledge so that many people can have access to that knowledge is important because what it does is that it extends the know-how. And I know Vlada will touch on the areas of uh, knowledge models that we've developed. Uh, these knowledge modules touch on different areas and we did that with Diplo. And it's very important because what it does is that it helps uh, practitioners to be able to adapt themselves at an early stage with the issues pertaining to where we are going. So those are the few interventions that I see coming up. But more importantly, and this is the final remark, is that nothing will happen unless there is a political will. So all that we are doing here, whether it is global peace tech, at the global level, there has to be the political will. That has to be understood. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. I mean, I think it's really true. I mean, cyber capacity building has been mentioned as a, as a tool to enhance uh, kind of um, safety and stability in the cyber domain. In the early days, uh, uh, all the initiatives were mostly focused on developing computer emergency response team and in, in building uh, drafting national cybersecurity strategies. But now it's, it's clear that cyber capacity building clearly needs to go beyond that. And there is an increasing need and effort uh, in building cyber diplomacy, again, for the need uh, 
the, uh, to, to enhance international cooperation in the several domain. So, and because of that, the Diplo Foundation is doing uh, amazing work into that, has been always doing an amazing work into that, of course, even before uh, all of us started talking about cyber capacity building. Uh, and uh, uh, Vladimir Radinovich uh, is uh, the director of cybersecurity and e-diplomacy at Diplo Foundation, is an extensive experience uh, uh, as lecturer, research and a practitioner in the domain of cybersecurity, cyber diplomacy, and uh, is a member, has been a member of the Global Forum uh, of Cyber Expertise Advisory Board and a member of the multi-advisory, multi-stakeholder advisory group of the UN uh, Internet Governance Forum. So, and, uh, and still, as I mentioned, doing uh, outstanding work in the cyber diplomacy capacity. So Vladimir, what, what's your take in, uh, in this discussion? Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for the invitation and apologies for not being able to, uh, to, to join you today. Uh, I have a good excuse, I'll tell you in a second. But uh, the, the way you put it, uh, with these, all these years, I really feel old. And uh, the, the truth is that we have been in, in, in uh, cyber capacity building now officially for 20 years. Uh, and the reason I, why I didn't join you now is that I just came from Malta where we had this uh, big summit on digital diplomacy and governance as a sort of a celebration of 20 years. And there are actually some message, there was a lot of discussion on cyber dip diplomacy, obviously, and capacity building, which is sort of our core mission. Uh, and um, I don't know whether you have diplomats in the room, so I, I have to be cautious. Uh, but now I, I believe they would also agree with this. The reason why it, it sometimes looks like it's all going very slow with cyber diplomacy or cyber diplomacy is that generally dipl diplomacy moves at the pace of, you know, as, at the glacial pace, as they would put it, you know, while technology actually moves much, much faster. And that's not a surprise. But if you look at how, uh, for how long we now have digital processes, starting from WSIS World Summit on Information Side, 2003, and then even looking into UN processes on, uh, um, peace and security and ICT, which basically were initiated in 1998, which is really, you know, 25 years now, we should expect to have more than what we have now in terms of um, presence of cyber diplomats and, and uh, countries. But that was not the, the, the case, uh, well, until recently, I would say, um, at least when it comes to developing countries. One reason for that might have been that capacity building is, is a buzzword. And, you know, whenever you don't know what to put or you want to become so, or show that you're smart, you just talk about capacity building, nothing develops. Not always, but it happens. Uh, but this is changing. Now, some of the, some of the um, parameters to show that, we just did this big uh, um, African study on cyber, cyber and, and diplomacy in Africa. And some of the um, numbers that show that relatively or, or rather small uh, level of involvement of African countries, for instance, is that in, in the six GGs group of governmental experts, which basically started 2004, uh, we had only eight African countries represented. Uh, in the open any working group in the last, what is it now, four years or more, we had about 16 African countries in the first and then 13 African countries in the second. Open any working group being, you can't say whether they were actually sitting in the room, that's hard to say, but at least being more active to say something, to contribute, it's a, that's a rather limited, rather limited number. And it's, it's not only that. I mean, if you go beyond Africa, for instance, my region, I come from Western Balkans, in the GG, we had only one Western Balkans. In the Open Any Working Group, only two of the countries were actually contributing with their own statements. Many of them aligned with the EU statements. That's a different thing. The good news is if you look at the Ad hoc committee on cybercrime, actually, you have since the beginning, which is two years now, 45 uh, African countries, which have been somehow involved and, and proactive, which also signals the level of priority. And that, that comes back to what Martin said, uh, priority of the countries and, well, level of, uh, of uh, uh, development of national policies where crime is a more tangible and more pertinent uh, issue than peace and security across many countries in developing countries, in, develop, in developing world. Now, uh, why is this all so slow? One thing, and you've mentioned some of them, one thing is certainly the awareness and understanding of many countries, diplomats again, which are, which are always uh, very cautious in catching up, particularly with things uh, related to technology, which sometimes they believe they don't know enough. Uh, now they 
figure out it's more about human aspects than about technology or equally about each, uh, where it, it needed time. And this morning we had the session, great session, a training session with African parliamentarians, uh, where, where you see more and more interest. And that's where I fully agree with the, what Madeline mentioned. There is increasing interest. Uh, but it's complex, you know, there are, there are certain parameters of this new world which are hard to, to grasp and comprehend. For instance, to what extent um, it is all about digital now, what, what I usually say, there is no more cyberspace. If you look all around, literally all the policies are not blended with cyber. There is no cyber, no cyber. So very soon we won't have them. And it's multidisciplinary. It's really complex. Then the other one is, that it is international, it's cross-border. There is almost nothing that you can do about cyber policies on a national level. You don't have control over your space in a way, on a, on a national space, right? That is that is rather new. It's hard to accept. Then there are new actors, I mean, big tech, right? There are many people like us to some extent. Uh, and what, what um, Jessica mentioned, that the stakeholders which are involved, they are not diplomats, but they are diplomats. Whether they they actually have a vote or not, most of these processes actually uh, take uh, consensus into consideration. There's a huge impact of that, and particularly the big tech companies, which literally are gatekeepers to all the issues that we are discussing here. Uh, and those things are hard to, to comprehend by many countries and, and uh, uh, diplomats as well. There is additional complexity beyond awareness is actually capacities that you mentioned, and that that means how do you not just what are the issues, and there is a multidisciplinary palette of issues going beyond security, human rights, economic development, you mentioned how intertwined that is, but it's also understanding this multi-stakeholder model that you mentioned. How do you actually interact now with Google when you know the uh, most of those companies that actually have bigger annual turnovers than, than all African countries one by one? You know, how do you actually interact with them? And then thirdly, it's a multi-level. You have to understand that it's not national level anymore. It is important. You, there's huge thing you can do on a regional level. We see that with regional norms. But we also see that with uh, you know, regional economies coming together and then maybe being able to actually talk to big tech. And then the global level, right? And then certainly there is another complexity for diplomats, which is, um, which is resources for many, many countries. There is a, a multiplicity of processes. Now, in the UN on, on security, what most countries would see as the same thing, regardless of framing the first and the third committee, uh, it's the, the open-ended working group, and then you have the ethical committee. So at least two processes, which in minds of most, are actually dealing with, <laughs> with dealing with cybersecurity. Some would even say with cyber, you know, depending on the level of understanding. But that's not enough. You have human rights, UN Human Rights Council. You have... Uh, World Trade Organization, uh, you have IGF, so all the aspects which are, all, all the other topics which are covered in the ITU, which are covered, which are also digital and intertwined. How can a small country um, dedicate resources when you know that a, a mission in New York for most of the countries, the mission to the UN, actually has three persons total? You know, so one person uh, not only is covering all of the cyber, but is actually covering also probably migrations and I don't know what, you know, climate change. It's really, really hard. Uh, and then, even on a national level, and that is not only in developing countries. Now in Malta, it was very obvious discussing with cyber ambassadors. It's a huge complexity in developed countries as well. Do you have a cyber ambassador? Do you take, have a tech ambassador or a digital ambassador? It's not the ambassador, but it's a coordinator. You have to have both. Where is he or she placed? Is it in the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or maybe in the in the Telecom Regulatory Ministry of Telecommunications? We have. Swiss ambassador, which is in Ofco, uh, what what issues are covering or covered by each of those, you know, and then between the ministries and, and institutions, in some cases in Africa, you don't have uh, people in missions that can actually participate in open-ended working group. So what happens is, you, like in in uh, Ghana, you have a, a CEO of the National Center of the CERT, which is actually most active. So there are many many complexities to actually handle that. And finally, how do we go about that? Well, uh, we can share more about some of the good practices. Martin mentioned the GFC knowledge models. It's really amazing endeavor where it is important uh, not just to know the topic that we want to do capacity building about. And probably sometimes even more important is not what, but how. How you deliver capacity, how you approach 
the target group? On what levels? Who you target? Top level, as Martin said, you, sometimes you have to have a high political level pitched. Sometimes you need practitioners. Sometimes you need diplomats. Uh, so it's a lot of adjustments. And well, at least from our experience in, with Diplo, it is a specific work. But I, I will be, I'll, I'll share optimism with Madeline that we are moving ahead. It, it's really moving and I'm, I'm quite happy that we see that we see progress. Back to you, Andrew. Wonderful, Vladimir. Um, yes, absolutely. I think you really managed to to kind of close the the the, the circle here that we 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 having with this round table, or to close the round table really. And uh, so I, I have, of course, uh, lots of questions. Uh, I think we 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 cover very well the the need for international cooperation with Madeline. So she was optimistic about that. And uh, we also covered the fact that uh, this international cooperation needs to be inclusive uh, of uh, uh, actors beyond traditional diplomats, because uh, the, 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 the protection of the cyber domain is a shared responsibility that should be inclusive of industry and civil society organization, but also inclusive of, uh, of a regional uh, interest uh, priority uh, con context. And, uh, and Vladimir, of course, uh, confirmed that uh, is really uh, the work that Diplo is doing and uh, is really feeling that there is this increasing need to create new forms of uh, diplomats beyond uh, reflecting priorities that goes beyond state interest. So that is my interpretation of the discussion we, we had so far. I would uh, uh, open the, uh, in, yeah, being inclusive with questions coming from the floor, if there are any. Yes, please. Okay, well, this must work. Does it work? Okay, yeah, it had that mic sound. So my first question was about states, um, which are major drivers of cyber insecurity. And what do we do about states that create cyber insecurity? And while I appreciate these diplomatic efforts, and I think it's really important to drive um, also international law forward and create the documentation. And there's, you know, there's a driving forward. And then there is also the reality of the situation, which is that, that we have a lot of states which are causing a lot of um, insecurities. So how should we deal with that? That's part one. But then part two is that currently the challenge is also about um, combining the states um, with um, international organized crime. And I think this combination of the two where the states are buying cyber insecurity or cyber threats from organized crime um, and organized crime is then providing is actually a really potentially extreme, it is a very dangerous um, situation that we are in when the states are apparently um, actively uh, finding partnerships in organized crime, which has um, basically exploded during COVID and is now um, in kind of unforeseen levels of intensity because of the war in Ukraine. And, um, and so perhaps my question, which as a combination of these two is, how do we deal with this difficulties and is it possible through these frameworks or do we need something completely different and can there be some kind of frameworks that actually in some ways also take into consideration the these aspects thank you the question is for whom I was actually thinking that the panel could just choose or anyone who wants to answer Wonderful, we like freedoms. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Hi. Um, I would have a, like a question of a, about like cl clarification. Um, so if we think about uh, diplomacy of cyberspace, uh, it's a bit different uh, from diplomacy via uh, cyberspace, or basically computational diplomacy. And that was... I was really curious of how you uh, in panel make a distinction between that uh, and regardless how you make a distinction, what are your interests in the other side uh, of the, about the 
computational diplomacy and, and diplomacy via cyberspace, especially if we think about, uh, you know, the, for example, the book of uh, Naked Diplomacy by Tom Fletcher and, and, and Twiplomacy in general. I was just curious how you, how you see that topic and that aspect, you know, in connection, in contrast, uh, or, or, you know, what is the interplay between cyber diplomacy as you see it and, and, and computational diplomacy? Thank you. Wonderful. And you give us freedom to, the same freedom. The more, the better. The more, the better. Cool. Any other? Yes. Yeah, mine was, uh, hello, I'm uh, uh, Michele Giovanardi from European University Institute, uh, Global Peace Tech Hub. And yeah, mine was more of a, of a comment, maybe also a question, but, uh, you know, it's like in therapy, when you recognize the, you know, the problems that are out there, it's already, you know, part of the, of, of the cure. And uh, it was, you know, kind of, you know, this failure that Madeleine was talking about was quite impressive because she was like, okay, there's a lot of attention on cybersecurity, but we've failed. There's no mar market driver, you know, to, to, to make this like uh, something that works. Basically, the, 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 yeah, the, the capitalist interest, you know, it, it's stronger than any initiative that we, we can put in place. And if that is for cyber, to, for cybersecurity, uh, with all the attention it's getting, I'm thinking of what we discussed these days, like peace tech, you know, that is like a bit, of course, connected, broader, including other kind of application data, uh, you know, satellites, you know, I think maybe it's there, it's even, might be even like uh, more complicated. So maybe, I don't know, uh, of course, this is like uh, difficult to, to address. We don't have like a, uh, you know, a crystal uh, ball or anything. And the other thing was um, what uh, Martin uh, was talking about is uh, bringing together different actors. And so maybe, you know, it would be interesting to understand, you know, um, how can this, you know, uh, if this is, a, this is effective and what are the challenges in bringing these tech actors at these tables and, uh, and what can be the strategy there uh, to, to, to engage them and to, to uh, bring them uh, on board, um, as you, as also Vladimir said, that the, the companies at the, end of, at the end of the day they are the gatekeepers. So, for me, that's uh, very important to understand also uh, from the global peace tech uh, hub perspective. And um, and yeah, and uh, and also of course, uh, I echo what Martin said about the political will. At the end of the day, is about getting the political will there uh, and to support these kind of initiatives. And there's many things out there. It's good to bring together the knowledge on these portals, but then it's also important to <laughs> get this out, you know, because we might do like great work, put all these resources together, but then you know, uh, it's not uh, effective uh, in, in you know bringing uh, out the message and make it like relevant for for regulation and policy making. So I don't know if this was a question or more of a reflection, but uh, it's for the whole panel as well. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Michele. So I'll, uh, I'll give the floor now to the speakers. If you wanna answer and take the freedom to answer as you wish. Oh, okay. Well, I I take the, the question on, on states because um, that, that's probably most up my, my lane. Um, and it made me think when you were when you were making those comments of this um, um, comment by by Joseph Nye and Robert Cohen, um, who are two big uh, international relations theorists, who, who who said basically like the discipline of international relations is forever talking about war, but for the great majority of of our time, states are not at war. So we should instead be looking at how how do they cooperate and 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 how are they interdependent instead. And I I, I think you could say this the same at this point in, in terms of cybersecurity that I would say by volume, the vast majority of, of um, uh, cyber incidents are, are carried out by private actors. The point you make about this crossover between cyber crime, which is absolutely hugely lucrative and state actors is where of course things get, um, uh, get complicated, but I think that at the diplomatic level, the real anxiety about cybersecurity is 
at this time is not so much about the incidents themselves, but that, that confusion around actors who's who could lead in, in, in the context of you know, existing political tension to an escalation um, in, in, into a kinetic conflict. And that's the, the kind of ambition is to prevent that happening. However, I would say that's already a, a little bit outdated limiting the anxiety to that because when we look at cyber physical systems that, that do have the capacity to have an effect in the physical world and therefore to cause you know, death and, and, and destruction in the physical world, then we have to be very mindful of what, what a state actor could do or any other actor in that, in that context. Um, so yes, I think we're a bit behind as, as you say, in terms of thinking about what is the potential and what we had better do something in a hurry. But so far, we don't see all that much activity from states. I mean, the odd, you know, the odd significant attack, but, but the vast majority of, of, of problems that we face are coming from private actors. Do you want to? Can I quickly ask a follow-up question? Um, what about the private sector? Because the Mars incident freaked a lot of people out. Um, so are you also seeing kind of support from the private sector post Marsk? I mean, the private sector is or, or, always ready to, to jump in and help where there's a fee. Um, you know, and, and, and not to be cynical about that, but certainly, you, I mean, the, the, there was a, a very interesting guy from Ukraine in a, on a panel I was uh, chairing last week who talked extensively about the support they had received from the, their, their private sector um, during the war. But I, I, I guess this comes back to this question of public-private cooperation or the or the public private partnership as we like we like to call it which I, I i'm just very very skeptical of because i don't see any partnership i see a commercial arrangement um and um i think there's a there's an assumption that there's much more of a partnership than than there is i think yeah we can draw on the private sector for expertise but i don't think there's there there is any kind of effective partnership at play there May, may I just, uh, did you ask about the Mars case? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, the cyber attacks the are getting not the Mars. Yeah, uh, yeah, with Mars, because I know a lot of companies, I mean, it was a malware attack that yeah. ended up hitting Mars very badly, but it was not aimed at Mars. Yeah, and that, that was solved entirely by Deloitte. So when it comes to support, it was Deloitte that solved the issue. So Mars went to Deloitte, paid a, a huge fee to make that uh, solving. So I'm not sure how much uh, support received from state, but the Lloyd for sure was the main actor there. So, um, I mean, moving on, we have a few more questions we need to address and then we, we can keep brainstorming. Uh, address the second question. Yeah, l l let me try and first of all clarify. I know, Ma Ma I know Madeline mentioned something around things on cyber and how that is working. Now, th there are issues here that we need to put in mind. When you look at the underworld, the underworld is a well-funded structure. So I worked in this uh, for quite some, some years. And what we realized was that you need to follow the money. Follow the money. Where is that money going to? Who is receiving that money? So that's how you end up looking at the underworld and in terms of who is actually demanding it. Now, the UN process is actually looking at this issue from an abstract level in order to, uh, to make sure that countries come to fold. I mean, we have even maritime laws. So what the UN process is doing is saying, these are soft laws. When I discuss with the lawyers, they say, okay, these are soft laws. After some time, they become hard laws meaning countries have to abide by that. And that's what we have to do in this particular process. But as we do that, you're right, there is going to be countries that are unstable, countries that will find a way to work with the underworld 
in order to undermine other countries and launch those attacks. That will happen. But what we have to do is also bear in mind, it's not only doom, 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 there's some positiveness because countries are taking things into their hands to make sure that their infrastructure is stable, they're cooperating and talking to each other in order to make sure that the infrastructure can be able to function. So a good example is the interest that countries have. Many countries have what we call the digital transformation strategy. They want their citizens to depend on the digital services. Their economy depends on the digital services and therefore countries have an interest in that. The private sector owns 70 to 80% of the, of the infrastructure. And as uh, Andrea says, the private sector will definitely have an interest to protect the infrastructure. So therefore, I would want to give you some hope that it's not all that bad in terms of making sure that we can track it. But you're right. Countries will always liaise with other, other worlds to make sure that that is done. And, and it's, it's, it's a problem. But as we keep on going towards that, let the UN process take its course. Let the soft laws become hard laws, just like maritime discipline and any other airlines are disciplined to that level, the same will happen to the cyber. So I, uh, I, I agree with you. Right now, it looks like a problem, but it will actually reduce as we go further, as we make it harder for the criminal underworld. If, if I may, Chair, let me just try and address the diplomacy issue. So there's diplomacy of cyberspace, but diplomacy via cyberspace. I think the truth of the matter is diplomacy can be won in both sides. What we need to do is to use cyberspace to its, uh, if I understood you well, where you're saying, can we achieve diplomacy via cyber? And we are looking at diplomacy of cyber, if, if I got it right. So the second aspect of diplomacy via cyber, I believe we can achieve something in there. And the example that I give here is, if you look at, for example, the financial inclusion, before it was very difficult for very, uh, it, financial, financial inclusion was meant for only the people who could afford to go to the bank and put money in there. But where technology came in, mobile technology, and I come from a country where we don't actually pay via cash, they pay via mobile phone. And that revolutionized the way financial inclusion is today. So you find very low income, the people that maybe Francisca mentioned, the, the excluded community coming into the fold to use that. So the same can apply in cyberspace in terms of diplomacy, where we have uh, areas where specific case examples are relayed via cyber. There is all this uh, information that is actually available to countries. And therefore, you can win the hearts and minds of specific regions or specific countries that are hardlined on specific areas through the use of cyber, through the use of technology. So I think I, I come to your point that you can win, but at the same time, I always go with this analogy chair that what technology gives, it takes in equal measure. So what we gain from technology, it can also take in equal measure. So as we go along doing that, there could be something like that. So back to the other question of, if you allow me chair again, the, the issue of uh, the different actors and how we can do that, I think that was a very good uh, intervention. My take on that is there are three areas to look at. Number one is let's look at it as supply and demand. So you need to build the demand and we need to look at supply. Demand means we have to make sure that we entice the governments to take interest in peace tech at the policy level, regulatory level, even legislation. So governments have to understand that peace tech is necessary for them. That can be done at the point of the cyber security strategy development or at the point of getting stakeholders as Madeline mentioned and Francisca mentioned, multi-stakeholder approach that demand has to be built at that point. The next issue is, of course, the issue around the awareness. So we need to bring awareness to the, to the ground because we deal with people who do not have the necessary knowledge of what's going on. I'll give you an example. In all the countries, they have what we call committees in parliament. Even the EU has committees in parliament. They decide what you and I are going to have in terms of whether it's technology or policy and, and so forth. Those committees that decide your future and my future do not understand sometimes issues that we are talking about. So therefore, bringing this to the decision makers 
at the political level is critical. And that has to be taken to, to that. And then let's look at the schools. Let's look at the infancy stage, bring it into the curriculum. Let's have examples, and I think Francesca is doing some work on that. Let's have the young people absorb this. Because if you have TikTok all over the world, people making funny videos and stuff like that, and we are not teaching people how to do cyber peace or tech, we are failing. And by the way, TikTok version for the rest of the world is different from China. Did you know that? It is different. The rest of the world are doing funny videos, parents, even my daughter now, we are joining into these funny videos, but that's what is happening to the rest of the world. So if you compare the rest of the world in 10 years time with the Chinese, we're in trouble. Thank you, Chair. Vlada first. Vlada, the floor is yours. No, ladies first. <laughs> as, you, as you wish. Yeah, okay. go, go. go for it. Okay, yes. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, focus actually on the first question, which I think is, is, uh, is somehow going through all of them. When you mentioned the, the reality check and the states are actually causing insecurity at every moment, not just the states, and this inter interconnection with cybercrime media, uh, it is definitely much more complex as a solution and a problem than just the negotiations and the UN process and all that, which is important. If you look at the ar cyber armament, let's call it that way, uh, our mapping of the publicly available documents the states uh, have when it comes to where they say that they have or are developing, investing in offensive cyber capabilities, basically capabilities to attack others, shows that there is 30 countries at least that we managed to map um, that have OCCs, the capabilities. And there are another 25 which uh, for which we can quite reliably say that they have. So it's 50 plus countries at least that have some uh, military cap capabilities to attack. It's a big thing. So the question is, can we have more transparency? At least if we cannot stop armament, can we at least increase the transparency of what they have? You know, with the nuclear weapons or, or other missiles, you can count them. Here you can't count them. So how do we actually implement it? How do we en uh, enhance the transparency? How do we uh, enhance responsible handling of those capabilities? For instance, the US has some of those um, uh, vulnerability equity process documents. There are some others that are developing. On what are the circumstances in which they can use this, these tools, right? So that's the armament. And in reality, the incidents, if you look at um, advanced persistent threat groups that we, have, that we mapped, even though they're mainly mapped by the Western actors, most of those are in Russia, China, Iran, um, North Korea, right? Which doesn't necessarily mean that they are the only ones who are doing that. And we know the, 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 the uh, reports of Google when they bumped on some of the US operations and so on. There might be less and more control and undercover, but they happen. But if you flip the coin and look where the hosting servers of most, most of the dark web are, it's actually in the US, in EU. Many of them are in Netherlands, many of them are in Lithuania, in, in Germany, in US. So it's also about due diligence, right? It's about accountability of those that are uh, implementing uh, sophisticated attacks, but also due diligence by us in the West, which is missing. Then if you look at vulnerabilities, and that's a particularly interesting part, and I, I was involved in, I've been knows and the others, in the Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior, where we actually gathered companies to talk about how do we make products more secure. And th there are many complex levels there, I'm not going to go into that, but there is an option to try to limit these vulnerabilities, as, as we mentioned, that sometimes a problem of, um, uh, of profit or investment by the company, sometimes a problem of uh, lack of awareness, um, negligence, uh, many, many factors there. Sometimes they really don't understand it. For many, like in the open source society, in technical community, we actually need capacity building for that. Awareness raising that what, what the vulnerabilities in their small products can cause at the end, the non petty or, or other things. Then you have the market of hacking tools and all of that. I mean, I can just mention the NSO group, but there are many others, some coming from Italy as well in the past, which are developing hacking tools and selling it legally. So how do we handle that on national, regional, global level? Then we have limiting the buying of those weapons. Do we need some more serious export controls and can they work like Vassanar Agreement, which has it, but it, it doesn't seem it work because you can't control it, right? 
And then the main question, and I, I, I think really that's what Madeline, what you mentioned is, is how do you hold states accountable? For my belief, and or at least my hope, is because stakes are getting higher, and someone mentioned uh, of the colleagues there, the new technology. So just look at little autonomous weapon systems, now integrated AI with, uh, with uh, uh, weapons, weaponry, integrated AI with uh, nuclear power plants, uh, integrating them with the satellites. Uh, things are exponentially growing and the risk is growing exponentially. My hope is that because the stakes are getting higher, then maybe the leaders will be more aware. There are many people in the governments which are aware, but the leaders are not. Maybe they'll get aware before it's too late. Uh, but I think it's about awareness about these stakes on, on the top level. Back to you. Thank you. Francesca? Um, actually, for once, I'm, I'm happy to be in the room. For once, I'm a little bit positive. I would, uh, I would, I mean, we started with optimism. We finished with optimism. Um, no, I mean, I, I just want to um, actually wearing my past hat of like a cybercrime expertise, uh, Maria, um, totally uh, well well spotted. I mean, um, when it comes to I mean, one worrying, let's say, area is indeed the, the um, kind of like the state-sponsored attacks, so not just the state attacks, but also the gray zones. Uh, and I think uh, Vlada uh, very well uh, put it, what I would call the democratization uh, in a way of uh, the uh, kind of like cyber criminality, making it more available, basically more affordable, also not necessarily to have like a professional cyber criminals, but clearly uh, to have like hackers for hire or like a crime as a service tools and so on and so forth. So definitely this is uh, um, um, a blurring line uh, that we see increasing uh, in terms of uh, um, I would say state and also um, uh, private sector responsibility, that's where I'm a little bit optimistic uh, saying that uh, I see more and more the, I mean, accountability being brought at the table. So um, regarding what Vlada was mentioning, uh, um, it's uh, it's true that more awareness raising, raising and education needs to be built. Uh, this is also why, where I mentioned uh, the multi-stakeholder um, community can uh, uh, bring a difference because uh, we can collect the data. There was uh, one comment about data. We can collect the data and we can start exposing and analyzing those data in order to uh, bring more transparency when it comes to uh, state accountability, uh, which is not there yet. So this is definitely something that I see happening i see also some sort of like peer pressure meaning uh, um, regarding what madeline was mentioning about bringing more i mean having more states willing to be at the table to discuss uh, i think also more states and this is our experience in uh, bringing more uh, i mean civil society organization and and, and businesses uh, to um, according to their expertise uh, and uh, showing the value again of uh, multi-stakeholderism, but also peer pressure from uh, private sector companies in uh, having a sort of like, what I would say, uh, safer or more stable um, uh, uh, cyber ecosystem. And I'm mentioning this specifically because you, Vlada, mentioned the um, NSO group. And on this, that's where I see more peer pressure coming from the private sector in uh, basically to keeping the bad guys out. Practical, um, I mean, I was recently at the Paris Peace Forum where um, um, we intervened in a panel uh, dealing with uh, the uh, proliferation or non-proliferation of offensive cyber capabilities where, I mean, where I see a sort of like opportunity is when it comes to spyware and targeted surveillance. Um, the private sector are trying to act a little bit as like pushing out the bad actors. And that's where I see an opportunity for collaboration. I just want to finish when it comes to how we can, uh, regarding uh, Michele's point. So how we can engage with the private sector when it comes to peace tech. Practical uh, example is let's establish, um, I, I tend to agree with uh, what the Madeline was mentioning about uh, being a sort of like a transactional and opportunistic type of relationship with the private sector. Well, let's uh, make it concrete and real. Um, civil society organizations and uh, I mean, uh, um, people on the ground can bring uh, practical use cases when it comes to peace tech that uh, 
tech companies or let's say um, uh, the private sector and uh, um, the um, academics uh, can help to solve. Uh, we have a couple of examples in, in Switzerland, in, in, in Geneva, uh, with uh, some PISTEC alliances uh, and also uh, some uh, partnership, for example, between uh, a humanitarian organization like the ICRC and a couple of uh, uh, academics institutions. So this is happening and this can, can happen. Second point on advocacy, um, I agree with you. Well. I have to say I'm a big fan of the civil portal of the of the GFC, but also in our experience, the point is not only, let's say, to collect, let's say, the information, but also to bring it out there and to use it for advocacy. This is, for example, what we what we tried with our platforms, not only about like collecting the data, but also transforming it and translating it for policymakers that is digestible, understandable, that this is something they can use. And uh, the third point, uh, and thank you so much, Martin, for mentioning the, let's say, the, the, uh, the, the education, let's say, path, um, where I still see a gap that we are trying also to bridge with, for example, the cooperation with the uh, GFC, with the World Bank and the World Economic Forum next year, we want to um, have um, uh, a global conference on cyber capacity building that is bridging together communities. This is something where we are still pushing for, so bridging together the development and the cybersecurity community. Um, this is also something that we started discussing yesterday uh, night with Andrea. Um, for example, I mean, having the peace tech community and the cyber capacity building community, this is also another avenue. And last point, how we can, uh, I mean, kind of like infiltrate the market, uh, let's say, um, cynical approach. Um, I'm a, a big fan of, a sort of like trend that, 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 that is happening a little bit more vocal in the United States, but they can see it across, which is the public interest technology or public interest the cybersecurity, for example. So building a curricula by which you bring together scientists, diplomats, uh, uh, I mean, more kind of like technical profiles, but also infused with human rights, ethics and law. Um, and uh, building this uh, via um, the university, but also trying to integrate much more the different communities in the capacity building approach. So really start thinking more about infusing sort of like the public interest or I would say cybersecurity for the public good. Um, and so making it as a sort of like opportunistic in that sense. So let's uh, bring more uh, cybersecurity people working for the public good. Super. Um, we are about to conclude the session. Are there, any, there are any questions from the online participants? We have not forgotten about you, not at all. Yeah. It's just a discussion. It's so lively here already. Any questions? Okay. I do have then a, a kind of a final last comment, so kind of an answer to your question. Uh, where diplomacy might fit into also the discussion we had yesterday about peace tech. Some, one of the, of the, we discussed a lot of the UNGG on cybersecurity. There are other UNGG or UN Open Ended Working Group. For example, the one that is particularly relevant for the discussion we had yesterday on the impact of artificial intelligence in peace uh, and, and, and war eventually, is the uh, UN Open Ended Working Group on laws, on lethal autonomous weapon system. That was a huge discussion that happened a few years ago where the UN led uh, these uh, uh, diplomatic efforts trying to uh, yeah, prevent an, uh, the abuse of lethal autonomous weapon system with the idea, of course, to prevent uh, um, the implementation of artificial intelligence for, uh, in uh, warfare, basically. So that's a good example that is, is worth to mention where the diplomacy could offer an important contribution there. And um, uh, sorry, I see some two chats. Ah, oh, there were some chats actually. Yes. Sorry. Um, thank you for enlightening session. Uh, much need to be done and many more session, more building, crucial towards more. Sorry, I'm gonna open, uh, read it. So much need to be done and many more sessions should be held to bring multi-stakeholders together to synergize efforts towards more cooperation, both internally between crucial cyber actresses and externally. This is a comment from Aika Jaridi. Thank you, Aika, for, for your comments. Very much appreciated.
Super. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we run out of time. Thanks to, to the speakers a lot for joining us in Florence for this lovely discussion. We're going to keep discussing all this in other venues and or eventually here back to Florence. And uh, thanks to the audience. And we go, uh, thanks for Vladimir to participate from Belgrade, I believe. Um, super. And to other online participants. Uh, thank you so much. A round of applause for thanking the speakers. Thank you. Bye, Vladimir. I wanted to ask if there was like